Okay, uh, good morning. Um, this is the first talk today and the last day of conference. So I'm kind of sleepy. You're kind of sleepy. Um, so we need to do something to wake up. We're going to visit the future. We're going to time travel to 2020, which is like, what, four years from now? Um, so I'm just going to type here, start. You, you ready? You ready? Can I press? Yep. Okay. Okay. Can't go to the future without sunglasses. So in the future, you're going to have a function main which takes sources and returns sinks, where sinks is the outgoing events, and sinks is an object that has here a property saying DOM where it's going to return a virtual DOM stream. Let's make that virtual DOM stream right over there like that, which is for now just a stream that has just a div. So if I save that, you know, it's just nothing yet, but I could put there, let's say, oops, um, I could put a paragraph inside it like this and maybe put like first name over here. And then you can see there, first name. Let me just drag this, put it there. And, you know, this is starting to be the future. And this, my friends, is programming. So here we can put, like, an input element as well if we want. So we can put first name class here with attributes, type, text. And let's just put a comma there because JavaScript, like, common commas. And we're going to also have the last name. And here we're also going to have the last class name and we're gonna put also a header there saying hello plus something let's put there for now um, empty string and now you say there but let's externalize the state let's put state over here let's call it name string which is now just a stream that has one empty string and I could get that and I could put name stream uh, I can map that to virtual DOM elements like this where I can put the name there near the hello like that so it still looks the same thing but I could put also for full stack fest and then it appears there so for now this is nice but nothing happens here I can just do that and you know what else can we do we can make here a const full name stream which will be a stream that has an array of first name and last name uh, and then once we have that we can get the full name and we can map each of these arrays of first name and last name. Um, let me also put this over here like that and let me map these two strings that say the first name and uh, last name and then basically the same thing but I could put here my name let's say um, Andrea over here and it shows there. So what else? Um, it still doesn't handle the events. How can we make that react to something. Let's take a look at how this app is currently working. We open the dev tools over here and we can see the stream graph and currently you know it just emits an array which is mapped to the virtual DOM. So let's do something more interesting. Let's make first name stream and that's going to be sources.dom. We're going to get events from the DOM in the, cell, um, in the first element like that and then we're going to get dot events. This is a stream of all the events of type input and we're going to map each event to event dot target dot value. And almost the same thing for the last name. And kind of like, oh, and I also need to do com combination of the first name stream with the last name stream. Uh, stream. And I also need to remember this one here. So now if I do that, okay, well, nothing shows. Um, let's see, uh, well, I do have my stream graph, graph here with first name and last name, and they're combined and the remember and stuff, but I don't have any initial event. As you can see, there's nothing green zapping. So I think I need, just need to put here um, the start with, because I need to initialize the first name that I forgot to do that. Let's just put that over there like, oops, like this. 
let's see if that works. Um, well, that worked. So I have an initial string and I have an initial last name. They are combined and it shows. So what happens if I write here? Oh, cool. Wait, um, that's not correct because, oh no, that's wrong. Um, because I want first name, the first name is the left side and last name is the right side. So why is this is not working? Um, okay, so something is wrong with the last name. Let's check what is wrong with this part. Ah, okay. Well, this is last. Okay, that, that was wrong. So let's see now how it goes. Uh, okay, that's right. The left side is working. Okay, the first name. How about the last name? Okay, that's working. So let me write Andrea Medeiros. Okay, so that works. So how about we put instead here a filter so that we only allow last names that are at least three characters long. So it would be length um, is at least three characters long. So if I do that uh, and you see uh, this works, okay, but M uh, should not do anything. As you can see, M does not pass, E does not pass because it's still less than three. But once I have D and the, what? Um, so that's definitely larger than three characters. So what's wrong with filter? It should be passing that filter. What's wrong with filter? Ah, I had a typo. Okay, so I could just change that like this. And maybe now this works. Okay, so Andre and M-E, you know, that's less than three. And D, it passes. Okay, cool. This is working like I wanted it to. So, um, <laughs> Back to 2016, um, we're in September, and so this is what you kind of like that you're back in the past. I mean, <laughs> anyway, th uh, thank you for the clapping. I'm, my name is Andrea Medeiros, also known on the internet as Andrea Stoltz, and what you just saw there was demo of a framework called. Now, uh, cycle.js, which I've been building now for two years, about two years, and this is not an MVC framework. Uh, it's a so-called reactive and functional JavaScript framework. So the reason why I built that is because um, when I started building it two years ago, there were three things that I wanted to solve, and nothing out there gave me that. So first thing, I wanted an architecture for any kind of UI, okay? Not just DOM elements, but also like, music, brainwave stuff, sensors, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, second, I want clean code with really good separation of concerns. And third of all, I want to know how does my code work always, okay? I want to know how it works in the microscopic level, but also in the big picture. Um, so, you know, I could just talk about these three things for hours, but I gave a talk on the first one and the talk on, on the second one. so. Now I think it's a good time to focus on the last point. So, sometimes you're programming, okay, and just hit a bug. So once you hit a bug, what do you do? You open the debugger and you start going through line by line, okay? And, you know, suddenly your program is like jumping around like, like crazy. And you're like, what are all these functions? What is the stack trace? Uh, so it's very hard to keep track of all of that stuff. So, but the debugger is super important because, you know, it tells you really accurately what your code is doing. Because sometimes you just want to stay in the editor and everything is nice and you just give your function to the framework and you forget, okay, I don't want to even see how that works. But, you know, if you need to solve a bug or something or improve performance, you actually need to understand this crazy machinery. And this is reality. I mean, this is always like, you know, open any program. It's going to be crazy jumping around. So what can we do? You know, a debugger really helps you understand code line by line, but it doesn't give you the big picture. It doesn't tell you, like, how things work in a glance. Uh, for instance, if I show you this piece of a jigsaw puzzle, does anyone know what the whole puzzle will be once I build it? Hmm? No? Right. So... Um, okay, I could, sh that's micro level information. I could show you another piece. Okay, now we have two pieces. Um, anyone know what this is about? No, still micro level. If you build the whole jigsaw puzzle, this is what you're going to see. Um, okay, now you can see kind of where that piece fit in that, you know. Uh, so, yeah, 
but before you couldn't see it. And this is the macro level picture. That's what I'm talking about. What a debugger gives you is this type of stuff. So it's a bunch of micro level information that's moving around and you're like, Ugh, how do I get this? You know, I want to see the big pictures. You can't. So every time you're staring at the computer, trying to understand how this crazy machinery works, you are building the so-called mental model of your program. And you know, this takes a lot of energy and stresses us out and stuff, makes us flip the table and stuff. So are there any tools out there today that help us understand the crazy machinery? Um, let's take a quick look at what's available. So if I want an overview of some source code, you know, Sublime Editor has the famous minimap on the right side. Um, well, how can I say? It's quite useless. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you, you know, how your code works. It just tells you, like, Durr, you have a lot of lines. There's also this thing called algorithm visualizer, which I think is pretty cool. Um, here it shows you the partial solution to the problem and how it's being solved while the algorithm is jumping around. So it's really cool to show those things. So uh, you over there, do you understand? Hey, you, yeah, do you understand this algorithm now? Understand it? Yeah, so probably not, right? I mean, it's really nice, but it's just like a debugger. It's still just jumping around. You need, still need to make the big picture out of those. So throughout history, we had stuff like uh, UML diagrams for visualizing programs, and some of them are really useful, like uh, the sequence diagram to explaining protocols and communication with the server. We still use those today, but yet others, like the class hierarchy diagram, they don't really tell you how does your code work. They just tell how your classes are structured. And in the past, we even had tools that would convert from this to Java code and from Java code to this. Uh, but let's not talk about those things. Um, yeah, so in modern front end, we're starting to have some really cool tools. This is called React Monocle, and it allows you to visualize the structure of your React components in real time. So if you change some props and some parent, then you can see that actually propagating throughout uh, the children, and it's pretty cool. I mean, this really gives you information, right? Because you have in your React app this uh, crazy machinery of components, the component hier hierarchy, and you need to understand that, and this really does that job. So I, I really like this, and it, this, this is the type of stuff that we need. But as you know, React is not everything. We need Flux or Redux, and so for instance, this here is uh, the Redux dev tools, and there you have the chart of your state tree, so you can get a glance uh, a big picture of the state tree of your program. And that's pretty nice. It's good that people are building this. Um, and the nice thing about an architecture like Redux is that, you know, it gives you a predefined mental model for everything, how all these apps work. So it's always going to be this diagram. You have state in the store, it goes to components, and it goes down in the component hierarchy. The user does a click and becomes an action, goes to the reducer, makes new state. Not, not, you know, you've heard the story before a couple of times. Uh, so we don't even need to visualize uh, the big picture of Redux data flow because it's always the same diagram, except it's not always the same. So like, if you have some asynchronous operations, uh, things start getting quite complicated. You use action creators with promises inside them then it's a different diagram, or if you use Redux Saga, right, that's another way of handling async effects, or uh, Redux Loop, right, that's another way. And also nowadays they have Redux Observable. Um, so some people even mix both sagas and action creators with promises inside them, and then it becomes a bit more crazy, right? It's not that simple anymore. So it's not anymore a predefined mental model for everything. There's a lot of variation going on inside this idea of Redux. And, you know, the devil is in the details. So once something is not how you think it is, you really feel like, I, w I need to visualize this thing, you know? So um, here's what I decided to do. I didn't want to build a framework or an architecture that always that was like predefined and always works in the same way. I wanted to allow flexibility and people to choose what they want to do. 
So what I wanted to allow is that given any program, okay, I just want to be able to get the big picture of the data flowing through this application, okay? Uh, through, uh, through all the ifs and else's, not like a debugger, not like a debugger, because I just already told the problems with that. So something that would like summarize this whole thing for me. Uh, and I also want to see it in slow motion because it's, it's easier to understand. So how do you visualize this stuff in the big picture? And here's what I found, you know, you can't, and I don't, I don't know how to. We need to replace this control flow. This programming model that we have of if and else and try and catch and stack trace, it just, it just can't be visualized. So we need to remove normal control flow, and we need to put something in its place. You know, We need a programming model which can be visualized. And that is a reactive stream, so I'm talking RxJS, observables, uh, most JS, that type of stuff. Um, so now people think that streams are quite hard, okay? They're like, oh, this is very scary stuff. Um, but I don't think they're hard. You know, they're just different. Like, if you know Spanish, then learning Portuguese is not that big of a stretch. Um, you know, it's rather similar. But uh, English is very different to Spanish, okay? So you could say, oh, English is hard. But actually, English is one of the easiest languages. You know, it's not that hard in absolute terms. So today, we're going to understand streams, OK? Um, and especially how streams are used in uh, Cycle.js. This is going to be fun. You ready? All ready? OK. You ready? OK. I think you're ready. Um, so here we have a stage. It's just like this stage, but it's uh, green. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's the stage. And we have also, <clears throat> besides the stage, we have the outside world. And in the outside world, things happen, right? Such as, you know, everything that happens is an event. So, red car passed by, that's an event. Or, blue car passed by, that's an event. Um, things happen. And besides these cars passing by, we also have Mr. Driver, who knows how to drive cars, um, but he also knows how to do anything else. You know, he's like a Mr. Janitor, but he, he, he's, he wants me to call him Mr. Driver. Um, so what happens on the stage then? Well, we have uh, Julia is on the stage. Say hello to Julia. This is Julia's face. Um, and what Julia does is that she likes to observe the outside world. So um, what she does is whenever a blue car passes by, Julia reacts by raising a sign. And her sign says plus one. OK? That's what she does. Um, I mean, if a red car passes by, she doesn't care. Black car doesn't care. Blue cars, for some reason. So it passes by, and she raises a sign. That's her whole life. I mean, she doesn't eat. She doesn't sleep. She doesn't go to the bathroom. She just stands there. Doing this. And then we also have Raphael. Raphael is also on stage. Say hello to Raphael. This is his face. And Raphael does almost the same thing, but he's interested in uh, red cars. So whenever a red car passes by, Raphael raises a sign, but his sign says minus one. Uh, as you see, Julia doesn't care. She's like, nah, that's not blue. Um, so yeah, so they just do this the whole day. Julia likes blue, one, and Raphael likes Red minus one. And then we also have Monica on stage. Say hello to Monica. This is Monica's face. And Monica, you know, she doesn't like cars. She doesn't like to observe the outside world. You know, Monica likes to observe Julia and Raphael right in front of her. So whenever they raise a sign, she's going to raise a sign as well. She reacts, OK? As you can see, I'm hinting the word reacts to you. <laughs> Uh, oh, and by the way, Monica has very good memory, so don't tell anything bad to her. She's going to remember it. So Raphael raises minus one, and then Monica raises uh, a sign. And her sign says three because she's adding up all of the numbers that she saw from them. So probably Julia raised uh, the sign five times, and Raphael raised the sign two times. So five minus two, three. So she remembers stuff. She's good memory. OK, so then we also have on the stage Dominic say, well, um, he's not so happy today. Uh, 
Yeah, anyway, Dominic also, he doesn't, he's not interested in cars. He's not interested in the outside world. He's interested in Monica. So he, he likes to observe Monica. And whenever Monica does something, he's going to do something as well. So there we go. Julia raises a sign. Monica raises a sign. And then Dominic raises a sign. And his sign just wraps whatever Monica said. So if Monica says 10, he's going to say div 10 div and so forth. And by the way, it's really important that they're facing this direction, okay? Um, because this means that they are observing stuff, okay? And not this, not this, not this. Because here they're not observing stuff. Like, Julia is interested in blue cars. How is she going to know that a blue car passed by? And she can't just hear a blue car, you know? So what would have to happen is the car would have to hit Julia, you know? And then she, okay, now I know. And then, how is Monica going to know that Julia raised the sign? She's not going to know. So Mo Julia has to go and poke her and say, yo, you know, do something. So this is bad because this doesn't give a separation of concerns. Julia cares about cars and signs. And then suddenly she has to take care of Monica and tell Monica, oh, yo, do something. So this, okay, this is good. And they just keep on doing this the whole day on the stage. Let me drink a little bit of butter. So remember Mr. Driver, uh, he can make things happen in the outside world. So Mr. Driver is observing Dominic, okay? And what he does is that he doesn't care about cars or the other people. He just cares about Dominic. And whenever Dominic does raise a sign, he builds that thing in the outside world, okay? So he gets div 5 div. He's like, okay. And he builds div 5 div in the real world. Um, so, you see, the driver is building real stuff in the world, okay? Those people on the stage, they're not building anything. Nothing gets built. They're just raising signs, okay? Information only. So, it keeps on going on. Raphael raises minus one. Monica raises four. Dominic raises div four div. And the driver builds stuff. And then minus one, three, div three div, and builds real stuff. And it's an interplay between the outside world and the people on the stage. So, you know, the stage is observing the outside world because Julia and Raphael are observing cars. And the outside world, Mr. Driver, is observing Dominic, which is on stage. So the stage is observing the outside, and the outside is observing the stage. And that's a cycle. Oh my god, that's where Psycho.js comes from. <sighs> Thank you. Um, yeah, th there we go. Uh, so. Um, how does it look like in code? Because you're not going to play Legos. Um, so uh, we have import there. We import extreme, which is a stream library like RxJS. We import cycle, and we import DOM driver. We make a function called stage. And then we connect the stage with the driver to observe each other. And by the way, we, we have the DOM driver because this driver takes care of the DOM world, elements and stuff. But we could have a driver that takes care of the HTTP world that does those type of stuff. We can have a driver that takes care of brain sensors, right, that type of stuff. So you get the picture. Uh, the stage takes as an argument events from the outside world, right? And then Julia is defined as those outside world events. She filters for only the blue car. And she's interested in events of type click. Uh, let's just rename click to pass by. So then we get, you know, blue car passed by events. And then she maps those events to plus one. So, you know, like in arrays, if I give you an array of events, okay, an array of events, you can map that array because you know how to map arrays to plus one each. Okay, that's the same kind of thing, but it's not an array, it's a stream. OK, so then Raphael uh, takes all the events from the outside world and is interested in red car passed by, maps that to minus one. Then Monica's events are defined as the signs that Julia and Raphael uh, lifted. But instead of mapping, she's using fold, which is kind of like mapping, but with memory. So whenever she sees a number from Julia, she's going to add that number to her memory and inform that. And her memory is initialized to zero. This looks like array.reduce. Um, and then we have Dominic, which is Monica's events mapped to this div that wraps the whole thing. I also included some buttons there and stuff. 
And then the stage will return Dominic's events to the outside world, which is the DOM. So uh, we can make a blue card to pass by by clicking that. And then you can see on the DOM Monica's memory. Okay? So how does this thing work? Okay, let's get a big picture view of that. We can open the dev tools to see uh, the gray squares with DOM. Though that's the outside world. And the blue is the stage. Uh, let's see this in slow motion. So once I click that button, that's an event in the outside world of DOM. Julia maps that to plus one. Monica maps that with memory. Dominic maps that to uh, the virtual DOM. And then that's sent out to the actual DOM driver, which builds the stuff. OK, this is, this is really, really the same thing that we did with those people on the stage. I'm just going to do one more trick here. Um, I'm just going to rename stuff, OK? Instead of function stage events, I'm going to call that function main sources. Just renaming, nothing else. And then Julia, I'm going to rename her to increment stream. And uh, she selects increment elements and sh events of type click. And oh, is that, does that mean that Julia is a stream? Yeah, you know, now you kind of get it, right? Yeah. So um, Raphael is decrement stream, and he selects decrement elements and click events. And Monica is renamed to count stream. So just renaming. And then Dominic is renamed to virtual DOM stream, which is count stream mapped to something else. And then we return the virtual DOM stream to the DOM world, and we plug those together. And you know, voila, that's how you build a counter app with Cycle.js. I mean, it's exactly how we saw before. Uh, what else could you build with this? Um, here's some other apps, like this is a simple app where you Click that button, and it downloads some user data from some server. How does that one work? If you open the dev tools, you're going to see once I click, that's an event in the DOM world. On the stage, we map that to a request object, and we allow the HTTP world to observe that request. The HTTP world talks to the server, and then it uh, makes a response car passed by, and we observe that car passing by, and we map that data to virtual DOM. And that's how it appears there on the screen. Um, then what else? We have also body mass index calculator, where there's, you can change the weight or the height with slider, and it recalculates that. So how does that one work? As you can see, while I'm moving this, I can see which part of my app is zapping, reacting to those parts. So this stage is a bit bigger than what we saw before. OK? So this is cool. I like it. OK? But you might be thinking now, OK, so what about you know, a real world app? You know, these small examples uh, are not enough. Um, what are you going to see if you open like, a real application? Are you going to see thousands of nodes and everything zapping between those? Does that give you a good big picture? Probably not, right? So it's not a good thing. Because this stage that we were handling was kind of small, you know, but what if you would have an even larger stage, like this stage, which is blue, um, and you know we have this blue fellow over there, and let's imagine there would be a bunch of others there. But you know what? What if we just put the green stage on top of the blue stage? So then Julia and Raphael are observing the blue guy there, and we can have another guy at the end, which is observing Dominic. And then the driver can observe those who observe those who observe those, do you get it? Like, we get components for free. Because once we build this green stage, you can reuse it. You can put it in any other bigger stage. And then you get, like, you know, in total, a bigger stage, right? And as you can see, now we have six people on that stage, which looked like a pyramid. So if we just keep on doing this, we're going to have a lot of people. Uh, and then it's going to be a real application, you know. How, how, how can we handle this? Well, what if I told you that we could just collapse the green stage into one person that has four heads? <laughs> I mean, and then you could expand it again, and you could collapse it again, and expand it again, and collapse it again. So now, hey, we have three people on stage. So that's better, right? It's small. So we can understand small stuff because our human brain is so limited. And now you can get a visualization 
of the big picture, okay? So that's how we would handle visualizing real large applications. And you would, you would never see thousands of nodes unless you actually want to expand all the stuff. Um, you, you would be able to understand each part in isolation because each of these stages is a function, right? So you can put function, calls a function and stuff. And, so, and hello, that's the idea of Cycle.js. I mean, of course there's more to learn. I can't possibly explain everything here, but you can check it out at that address. And this is a framework that uh, allows you to write code which is visualizable. Um, like, see this diagram? I didn't draw it. Um, the dev tools didn't draw it. Uh, this is something that someone read the reactive uh, introduction to reactive program you've been missing, and they just decided, mm, I'm going to draw that. Okay, I didn't teach them that. They just did it themselves. They just noticed that oh, I can visualize this, and they, they drew this. And this other one, uh, I was mentoring a programmer at work, and he was learning CycleJS, uh, but I didn't teach the, him this, and he just went ahead and he drew the data flow diagram for his application, you know, which is a real world application. And you can see there the stage and the drivers and stuff. So, you know, I don't think you can achieve this with normal imperative programs. You can't do that. So that's what I want to help the world achieve. I want, want to help you be able to get a big picture glance of how your program is working. Thank you for listening. I hope this was enjoyable and maybe you learned also something from it. Thank you very much. How long did it take you to make Cycle.js? Well, it's a free time project that I've been doing like on my free time for a year. And then after a year, I was able to get like some time from work and even more time from work. So I don't know, you know, two years on your free time yeah. basically. And it's MIT licensed. Yeah. Cool. I love it when people spend hours of their own time and then give it away. That's really generous. Thank you. Um, the cars that were driving past the stage seem to have no drivers. Are they from the future as well? The thing is, I ran out of people. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I just got lazy, but anyway. Excellent. And another you question. You have imagination, come on. One <laughs> of them had a driver without a head, so maybe. And another question from, about the future. In the future, you were coding in JavaScript. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you think that will be the case, or will we all be, all be using transpiled languages? We're always going to be transpiling. I'm quoting uh, Jafar Hussein. Um, of course, this was not the future, people. You know, this is just me pretending the future. <laughs> but my message there was uh, this type of tools that you can get, the dev tools. Regarding the language, you know, we could use all kinds of languages. And we're get, definitely going to have a lot of stuff transpiling to JavaScript, like we have languages built to transpile on JavaScript, like PureScript and Elm and a uh, bunch of others, CoffeeScript. I can't say that, sorry. Uh, hmm. um, but you get the idea. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up to Andre Stoltz.